says, well, we have the answer. You know, everybody else is wrong. <laughs> I mean, they had great food. Wow, best food. But I didn't know how to understand, you know, because the devotees at that time were very young, very new, and they didn't really know how to preach very well. And so they were presenting things in a kind of a dogmatic way, you know, like, you have to give up eating meat. You have to chant this mantra. Prabhupada is the greatest guru ever. You know? <laughs> and I was going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate that. All the groups tell me the same thing. Yeah. Well, what do they have? What do they have that? Guru Maharaji. Guru Maharaji is the greatest guru ever. You know? Reverend Sung Young Moon is the greatest guru ever. Uh, you know, go down the list. Yogi Ananda Nanda Nanda. <laughs> He's the greatest guru ever. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. But here I had real evidence in my field of expertise. I'm supposed to be a professional composer. I'm supposed to know how to produce music. This is why I was asking this question. I always wanted to be a composer but since I was a little kid. You know? Why or how do I write music that has a specific effect on people? If, let's say, I want to make people happy, or I want to make them sad, or I want to put them through a bunch of changes, how do I do that? How did Beethoven know that the, the things that he wrote were, would reflect nobility and, you know, courage and so many qualities? How did Tchaikovsky know that what he was writing would re reflect the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, and the romance of the Swan of Turinella, you know, all these things? How did they know? How did they, you know, I mean, you can copy. If you want to write, okay, I want to write something that sounds like Tchaikovsky or, you know, romantic music. Okay, I can copy and I can, I can use the same style and like that and somehow or other people will associate it. You know, but that's, that's very limited. That's on the psychological level. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know on a deeper level, how does music actually touch our heart? So, through Vedic scriptures we can understand that there is something called rasa. Rasa means the sweet taste of a particular relationship. See? You know, if, if Beethoven is feeling nobility, if Bach is feeling devotion, if Tchaikovsky is feeling, you know, tragedy and all these things, they're always in relation to something or someone. See? It's Romeo and Juliet, not Romeo and the mirror. <laughs> so, to how did they how did they get this? Well, they had some great talent and they had some inspiration, but I wanted to know like scientifically. I was a scientist. I was brought up like that, you know. To I, I was into science, physics, especially and astronomy and electronics and stuff like that. I was really into all that stuff. So I wanted to know. I wanted something like physics. Mm -hmm. where if you know two or three equations, basically you can derive the whole rest of physics from that, right? Give me something like that for music. You know, nobody can give. But then when I came across the science of rasa, then it was all clear. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the, the harmonic series, and then you extract the, the harmonic the overtones, the partials from the harmonic series, and those ratios of vibrations each have a specific emotional taste. And then you put those together into scales, and the combined effect of all those notes has a specific mood. Huh? And then, then you find a way of navigating that scale, and that's called a raga. Huh? And each raga emphasizes particular notes, and he emphasizes others, and because of that, each raga has a specific mood. And then I got that far, and I hit a, a wall. Mm -hmm. Okay, why are these certain ragas played at a specific time of the day? Nobody could explain this to me. And I had to go deep into this subject of rasa, deep into Krishna's pastime. It took me 20 years to understand the answer to this question. Yeah. That because Krishna every day has a, a, a routine, a schedule of pastimes. 
And these are called Ashta Kaliya Lila, the Eightfold Daily Pastimes of the world. So every day, Krishna gets up very early in the morning. And he is out in the forest with the gopis. They're like, you know, passed out. <laughs> <laughs> and they all wake up, you know, it's very early. And the birds start twittering and sun begins to come up. And, and then Vrinda Devi comes and says, Radha, Krishna, come on, you have to get home. You don't want your parents to discover that you're not in your bedroom. Oh, this would be terrible. Come on, come on, let's go, let's go. So there's this big scene, and there's the parting, and then, then they run home, and then they get into, crawl into the bed just as the sun comes up, and Mother Yashoda comes into the room. Oh, Krishna! <laughs> <laughs> Time to herd the cows. Come on, let's get up. He's like, oh, can I sleep just a little longer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Krishna is so tired. He, He's such a good boy, and he works so hard raising, you know, taking care of the cows. Okay, just sleep a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, Krishna gets up and takes a shower and gets dressed, has breakfast cooked by Radharani, and then he goes out with the cowherd boys and calves into the forest, and they have all kinds of adventures and you know, killing demons and all this stuff. And then they have lunch, which is a huge, big production. Um, and then they all take naps, except for Krishna. He goes, sneaks off, and meets Radharani somewhere in the forest. Uh, and then he comes back. There's more cowherd boy adventures. They come back to the village. Then they all get cleaned up, have dinner. And then the family sits down, and they hear uh, recitations by the sages from the Vedas. Uh, like we're doing right now, about about the same time, uh, on Sunday. And then, Mother Yashoda tucks Krishna into bed and says good night, and they all go to sleep. Except Krishna. <laughs> he gets up, you know, sneaks out of his room, down the down the drain pipe, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> and he goes out with the gopis. So then they're out in the forest dancing and having all kinds of romantic adventures and like that. And then finally they pass out with sheer exhaustion about 2 o'clock in the morning. And then the whole thing starts all over again the next day. So of course, during this whole day schedule, there are many, many different moods, different activities, different styles of worship and service of Krishna. And, uh, all these things are going on in association with his devotees. They're relationships. And these relationships have a certain taste. And that taste can be expressed by a particular raga. Ah. <laughs> so the answer is that the ragas are in the system the way they are because they mirror the pastimes of the Lord in the spiritual world. <laughs> that was such a big you know, this huge realization uh, took a long time because th that had been forgotten. The system was there and it had become a tradition. You played this rag at this time, this rag at that time. Why? Who knows? It had been forgotten. It had been lost. And through our work, through our research, we were able to rediscover it. You know, it's like one, one person has one piece of the puzzle, another person has another piece, another has another. And you have to go and get all this knowledge and put it together and then see how it fits and suddenly, ka -chunk, it makes a hole. And you say, ah, that's it. So this is all expressed in our works on music and like that. But the important point is, all this knowledge is implicit in the scriptures. You have, to, you have to tease it out. You have to analyze the scriptures. Not just read them like a, like a novel or something. Uh, or, on the other hand, some kind of technical book. You know? But really, really uh, contemplate them. Try to understand why they are the way they are. Why the worship of the Lord is done in the way that it is done. And then you will come to your own realization. Each and every devotee has their own 
specific personal realization of Krishna. It's not that you'll get the same relation or the same realization as I or as Sri Prabhupada or as any other devotee. Each devotee's relationship with Krishna is completely unique. But that relationship is exactly perfectly satisfying for that devotee. That's the wonderful thing about it. So Krishna is uh, well, Krishna is unique. <laughs> <laughs> There's nobody like Krishna. So when we worship Krishna, when we chant Krishna's name, when we uh, do different services for him, we see Krishna in exactly the way that, that we have a relation with him. And other devotees, they may see him in a different way. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Different tastes, different people, 